We are back at that 1914 Passive House remodel project. Now, if you missed the last video, there's a link in the description, but we talked about insulation and air tightness and how this house basically has double the insulation value of a standard code-built house. But on today's build show, we're gonna be talking about the mechanical system. How do we heat it? How do we cool it? How do we bring in fresh air? And we're gonna talk about how much it costs on this house and what you might wanna budget for a good mechanical system for your house. Let's go up to the mechanical room and meet Miguel from Positive Energy. Okay guys, we're up in the attic mechanical room here and I've got with me Miguel Walker from Positive Energy. Miguel, you guys are a building science and mechanical engineering firm. You've done all my work for about the last 10 years designing my systems. That's right. But we are not in one of my houses. Uh, this is the same house we talked about before that's a going to be passive house rated house. Clean Tag's the builder here. Forgecraft Architecture is uh, the architects. And this is actually Trey's personal house who you met on the last video. But tell me about this passive house standard that uh, we're talking about today. Yeah, passive house is an amazing standard. It's well beyond code. It's a high performance, metrics based, outcome based standard that is really aimed at making sure you have a very durable house that lasts mm -hmm. a long time with a very healthy indoor environment. And the folks at CleanTag and Forgecraft were phenomenal to work with. It takes a lot of design and a lot of thinking to accomplish those things. So getting in early and really having a good team makes all the difference in the world. And, and they were phenomenal to work with. Yeah, now this one's not rated yet but what system will this be rated under? That's right, so uh, Passive House has kind of a, a colored history in the United States, it, especially when it comes to the hot, humid South. It didn't get the uptake that I think a lot of folks were hoping it would because mm -hmm. it required more insulation than was really necessary for our climate zone. And so Trey's house is participating in the 2018 uh, standard. He's one of the pilots for that, ah. that new standard. And it's much more climate specific, so you're not over insulating uh, for a house that you would, let's say, in Minnesota or, or Ontario. All right, we're making more of a southern based insulation package. That's right. Still very tight airtight standards mm -hmm. and still very strict energy standards. Though, That's right. right. Absolutely. Good deal. Now, with that being said, talk to me about this mechanical system. Because yeah. we've got an amazing enclosure here. We talked about that last time. Really double the insulation value that code would require tons of triple glaze windows, just a really bomber enclosure, also very, very airtight here. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we need to do for a, an enclosure like that in terms of mechanicals? Well, so the enclosure is gonna dictate how the mechanicals need to perform. Mm -hmm. And the airtightness is a big part of that in Passive House. So you really need to think about how you're going to keep the occupants thermally comfortable, gotcha. how you're going to keep the air healthy and filtered. So thermally comfortable, that's the temperature, right? That's how right. we're going to satisfy the thermostat. That's and right. And then keep going. And what is what were you saying about comfort then as well? So comfort is beyond just the way that we experience what the thermostat says. Mm -hmm. It also has to do with the quality of air that we're breathing in and that we're swimming around in virtually all the time. Yeah, that's right. So our system here actually takes into account uh, all of the elements of thermal comfort and human health and puts them in one convenient, well thought out package. All right, so that being said, talk to me about the big black box, which is doing the heavy lifting on thermal back here. Absolutely, so this is a VRF system made mm -hmm. by Mitsubishi. You've featured their equipment on many episodes. A lot of One of the best things about VRF systems for tight, well enclosured houses like this is that you have ramp down capacity. So you're not blasting a ton of cold air in the space just to satisfy what the thermostat says and then running into humidity elevation issues by overcooling. It's able to ramp down as it needs to and just coast. Yeah, so in a really good house like this, even on 100 degree days, let's say, it's gonna take a long time for the house to heat up. That's right. If this was a single stage, you only have, let's say if it was three tons, 36,000 BTUs going. Yep on or off, two stage unit, maybe it could ramp down to 60%. But the big deal on VRF, we've talked about this before, is it'll ramp from 15% up to 100%. So it could run at 10 or 15,000 BTUs, or maybe 20,000 or 25 or 30, depending on where the loads are. Absolutely. Which means it doesn't need to blow this massive amount of cold. It can kind of puff it in where necessary. Absolutely. And if Trey has a party, uh, you know, Thanksgiving family over, something like that, there's a lot of cooking going on mm -hmm. in the house. This is more than capable of handling that extra load as well. That makes sense. Now, what's the big white box we got above here? So we live in Austin. It's a very hot, humid place, mm -hmm. and we have long shoulder seasons. So yep. during the spring and fall, when uh, this machine here isn't necessarily running and yep. keeping 
the air as dry as it needs to be. Mm -hmm. We have this. It's an ultra air dehumidifier. They're yep. a phenomenal company uh, based out of Wisconsin, American made products. Made in the US. They're, they're, they're fantastic. And for those shoulder seasons, it's going to do the heavy lifting that this thing can't. So this little box right here, 70 H means 70 pints. It can remove out of the air That's right. in 24 hours. It's going to dump it down that condensate drain, which is yep. on the back side there and then it's gonna dehumidify, but it's also gonna drop some heat into there, right? Because yep. the compressor's inside here. That's right, so you need to consider, uh, when you're designing a system, you have to think about where this extra load is gonna be. And distributed across a whole house, it's not a, a significant dry bulb add to the house. Yeah. And because it is drier air, even though it's warmer, it, you're gonna run into less of a comfort penalty there. Yeah, that but makes sense. the great thing is that, you know, this system is designed to cool a space. Mm -hmm. As a random side effect of that, the compressor in the fan will dehumidify. This system is designed specifically to remove humidity from the space. Yeah. So the compressor and the fan are designed to handle that load. Yeah, the, the interesting thing about this system, Miguel, and what you've designed here, really pretty simple system. We're a little more than 2,000 square foot house, mainly single story with just a little bit of second uh, story here. And this one system can do the entire house. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. And one important thing we should talk about on the return side of this system is the filtration, right? So we've talked about keeping people comfortable, this and we've like talked about keeping the air dry. Made and in now, Switzerland right here, That's it? right, so this is the IQ Air Perfect 16. Tell me about this thing. This is a phenomenal filtration system. It's a MERV 16 Ooh, system, and you that. can see we've got pleats on pleats on pleats. So MERV 16, that's like HEPA quality, That right? is HEPA grade filtration. So you're getting down to the PM 2.5 level of filtration, which is Dang. all of that nasty particles. stuff that gets in our lungs that we can't get out, yeah. um, that our bodies can't filter out. So this is doing the heavy lifting from a filtration perspective. That's cool. Hey, we haven't talked pricing yet. Let's take a second to talk pricing because I know people watching are curious how expensive this is, what this would cost in their house. Typical new construction where people aren't necessarily doing things well. What is a builder spending on an HVAC system? You know, we see a lot of one to two percent Per total percent of construction costs, and that's just abysmally low. We're that's talking crazy. about flex runs that are just really shoddily done. Yeah, and so it, in a million dollar house, we're talking about 20 grand for exactly. the HVAC system. That's, oh. Yeah, and you know, I don't think it's super cheap. necessarily a byproduct of laziness so much as it is profit incentive, right? So yeah. people want to get the job done fast. They want to get on and move on to the next job. And they don't know any better, right? I mean, this equipment, you have to think about it. You have to specify it. Okay, so in contrast to that one or two percent, what are you guys telling people a system like this should cost if you're budgeting for yeah. new construction or remodel? That's a great question. And even passive house standard. We try to set expectations very early on in the project, which is why it's great to work with an architect, you know, when they're still in concept phase, trying to yep. figure out what the house is gonna be. You can help set expectations by talking with the architect, talking with the client, and making sure the builder knows the implications. And we're seeing between four and seven percent, depending on the house. Okay, so yeah. forty grand to seventy grand, let's say on a uh, million dollar budget. That's right. Yep. The bigger the house gets, you're going to see some roll off on that budget number. Yeah. But the for smaller houses, it's certainly going to represent and occupy a larger slice of the pie than I think a lot of people are used to. Yeah. But that's that's part of change. That's part of uh, the friction that comes with stepping up the game and requiring better quality. That makes sense. Uh, uh, my guess is this house is 500 to a million or so uh, Sounds in terms about right. of construction costs. So you can do the math yourselves. At the very lowest, 4%. I would guess that a system like this is probably more like five or six percent though. The smaller the house, the smaller the uh, budget, the higher the percentage overall it needs to be to get good equipment. Now we haven't talked a lot about ducts yet, Miguel. Yeah. But tell me about the duct work that's, that's going on here. It looks to me like you've got a lot of metal. We absolutely have a lot of metal. So a part of that, that budget range that we're discussing is, includes all of the upgraded boxes, I think, that mm -hmm. a lot of people aren't used to. Yep. But it also includes our design fee. Yep. It includes the installer overhead. And it includes upgraded distribution. Yeah, because yeah. frankly, the distribution is the most important yeah. thing yep. that you're going to run, that you need to accomplish for a good system. And I'll brag on these guys a little bit. You know, when you hire a firm like these guys, and there are some other good firms out there doing the similar kind of work, you're actually going to get a layout that they've um, talked with the uh, uh, structural engineer. So they've designed this for this particular space, for the house, for the type of framing we're encountering. They're showing the installer exactly what they need. You know, this is a 12 inch round rigid duct. They're showing where they can run some flex and they've got flex in the last maybe 10 feet on some of these runs to quiet it down. That's right. They're showing a little more flex in the return side than on the supply side. 
So these guys do a great job of specifying that, and it's worth spending the money to have yeah. it designed ahead of time and not just doing a design build like is typical on American uh, new construction. Well, and as you can see in this attic space, you know, we got in with Trey very, very early. And so he was able to provide a significant portion of the attic space to actually work out the mechanicals. Yeah. And in modern construction where you have, d you know, form factors that don't necessarily allow this sort of thing, mm -hmm. having a design is absolutely critical yeah, because your sure. tolerances are a lot lower and you really need to make sure that that space is gonna perform in a way that keeps the occupants comfortable and keeps them healthy. So getting involved early makes a huge difference and having enough space advocating for that space early on is a big deal. Yeah, it's huge. Hey, before we move on to one other cool system I wanna show, let's talk about cost for a VRF system, whether it's Mitsubishi sure. or LG or Daikin. Yep. Um, how much more are these than a standard, uh, you know, traditional system, shall we say? You know, frankly, th we're seeing a lot of uh, competitive bids between the higher end two-stage systems and VRF systems. Yep. It entirely depends on your market. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if we're, if we're talking about le let's do one thing right, mm -hmm. I don't care so much about the box. I think these are amazing, well-engineered systems. Yep. Yep. But get the distribution right, because if agree. you don't get the distribution right, that's stuck in the house forever. And it's very expensive and inconvenient to tear out. Yeah, I mean, your duct's gonna be there three or four times longer than right. this box, which might get replaced in 20, maybe 25 years. Your ducts are gonna be in there 7,500 years That's before right. they get replaced. So if you if you have a cash flow issue on your project and you need to, you know, leave one thing out, put something in first, go with the ducts, you can always upgrade the box later. But if you've got it, this is a phenomenal piece of equipment to put in. Yeah. It's great for energy, it's much more accurate for thermal comfort, and frankly, they, the lifespan of these uh, units is, is very long, so yeah. you yeah. get a great return. Last thing, on the uh, dehume, you know, most projects in the South do not have a dehume spec, so this is a cost adder for most builders out there. What, what can you expect on a dehume installed? Can you, can you give any range of pricing? You know, the box itself is, you're gonna run anywhere from a grand to two, I'd mm -hmm. say, for kind of the average yeah. uh, typology. Yeah. But not having a dehue doesn't negate physics. That's that right. humidity still exists in the air. Yeah. So if you're not treating it, you're just ignoring the problem. Right. Frankly, these are a, a must have in any hot, humid climate, in my opinion. I don't, I don't build a house without installing one anymore. Yep. Um, so one to two grand for the equipment it sells. Remember your HVAC contractor needs to make profit on that. He needs to install it. He needs to supply it. So you, you're probably gonna budget maybe three to five grand for a dehume. That's right. Depending on the size of the house, you might need two. Um, but these are amazing units. All right, so we've talked a lot about heating and cooling, uh, filtration. One of the comments I get a million times on my um, YouTube channel, Miguel, is, Matt, you're building these houses too tight. People are gonna die in there. Yep. What have we done about fresh air in this house? Well, I think it's important to note that you do not have a long trail of dead bodies on That's your right. projects. That's right, and uh, I've been building tight <laughs> houses for a long time. Building tight essentially eliminates all of the nasty stuff that can occur in the wall cavities, yep. right? Yep. So what you're doing is you're just centralizing and controlling where the ventilation air comes from. That's right. In old houses, people thought that they needed to breathe primarily because they needed to dry, yep. right? Your wall would get wet, it needs some way to dry. Yeah. And we have amazing wall systems, amazing enclosure systems that yeah. are designed to dry to the outside That's if right. they need to, right? So by making this a really airtight space, we've done what you should do and provided an ERV, which controls the uh, ventilation in a balanced way in the yep. house. Miguel, just to summarize, build tight, ventilate right. You know, people who say we should build looser houses, they just don't get it, right? If we were gonna build a loose house, we might as well just leave a window open in the house that a homeowner can never shut. That's the same as building a loose house. We wanna build the tightest house we can of course, we have operable windows, so if the power goes out, they can open their windows and have some fresh air. But that being said, we've got a really smart ERV system in this house. So walk me through how the ERV works on this house. Absolutely. Go. So an ERV stands for an enthalpy recovery ventilator, mm -hmm. or it's more commonly known as an energy recovery ventilator. Yep. And the reason it's called that is because it actually does re recover a lot of the thermal energy that you've already paid for with yep. a thermal comfort system to keep in the house. Yep. You don't want to just bring in hot, humid air that you're going to essentially lose all the money that you just spent. Right? So in the South, we use an ERV rather than an HRV. An That's right. HRV is just recovering heat, meaning in the South or in the North where you're often bringing in cold air, we're gonna mix the air streams in this core 
so that we're moving some of the heat and it's tempering that cold indoor air. That's right. But in the south, we're typically dealing with humidity outside. And so it's moving those air streams and it's moving a little bit of that humidity from the indoor to the outdoor. Remember though, it is not a dehumidifier. That's right. So most of the time what I do is I use my dehumidifier for fresh air and the ERV is the next step beyond that. If you've got an, uh, a dehum already, then this is the next step beyond that. So walk me through how this one works then. So yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. You need a dry, cool air mass, mm -hmm. right? So you're gonna have an intake and then that's going to go across the core yep. to a supply yep. and that supply is going to go to every single room. Yep. Then you're going to have an exhaust from the return that you, you design in your ductwork and that's going to go to the exhaust uh, in that, that actually dumps outside of the house. Gotcha. And so what's amazing about the Panasonic ERV is that it has two different fans in it mm -hmm. that you can vary the speed of. Ah, you so can you can tune it a little bit. Tune it down to the exact kind of positive or negative pressurization that you're going for, yep. which here in the south, hot humid south we're almost always positively pressurizing slightly yep. uh, to push out those those pollens and allergens from the areas of leakage that there still are in the enclosure. The thing about this one I like is pretty small, um, pretty straightforward, nice replaceable or cleanable filter. Absolutely. And frankly, pretty reasonable on cost. From what I've seen, these things run uh, just for the unit themselves, like under 1500 bucks. So that's, that's right. That's pretty nice compared to some of the more expensive ones, which have greater capacity, of course. So walk me through where we're pulling air out of in this house. So the ducts, we have a dedicated distribution system for the CRP. And so it, it doesn't have a home run system, but we have designed a return side of this and mm -hmm. a supply side of this that's okay. going to each room in the house. And then we've tuned the fans to make sure that that is positively pressurizing the building uh, very slightly. It's not, it's not a lot. It's not going to make your ears pop when you How open the door. How many CFM do you think we're talking about for a unit like this? How much is it moving? So you can see here, the fans can actually move up to 100 CFM each, okay. gotcha. uh, both exhaust and supply. Gotcha, so, so we're not talking about massive amount of air. 100 CFM out, 100 CFM in at the max, and you can tune that based on your size, right? This 2100 square foot house may not need 100 CFM, maybe 60 would do it for this house. That's right, and it entirely depends. Your engineer will be able to tell you exactly what you need. And one of the great things about this is that when you have a dedicated distribution system for it, it's not a huge cost add because mm -hmm. you're talking about much smaller ductwork than you need for the larger fans. Yeah, these are small four and six inch ducts. That's right. And then each one's running into a bedroom. So as you're sleeping at night, you're puffing in a little bit of fresh air to mm -hmm. each one of those bedrooms. But that's not fresh air like your windows open fresh air, that's your cool, dehumidified and in this case thoroughly cleansed air because you've got that HEPA quality filter. That's right there. and you've got a filter in the ERV, you've That's got right. a filter in the dehumidifier and you've got a filter on the return side of the system so you are talking about a lot of really great filtration on this house. Miguel, amazing house, great job on the design. I'll put a link in the description to Miguel, to the architects, the builder, all this equipment. This is not a sponsored video so none of these guys are paying us to make this video so I'll put a link to this description but what you're seeing here is a really good system for a really not very big house, but we're talking about equipment that's gonna provide comfortable, fresh, filtered, measured air. It was installed really well, and trust me, it's worth the extra money to spend it early on on a good system that's designed and installed well with good equipment. Guys, if you're not a Build Show subscriber, hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show.